Welcome to the 59th episode of The Logan Bartlett Show. I am your host, Logan Bartlett, and what you're going to hear on this episode is a conversation I have with Robin Hansen. Robin is a professor of economics at George Mason, but the reason for this conversation was he was very early to the field of artificial intelligence, and most notably, he had a series of debates 15 years ago with Eliezer Yudkowsky on the future of AI. Eliezer has become best known uh, of late as a AI doomerist, thinking that the path we're currently on is going to end humanity as we know it. So Robin and he had these debates 15 years ago, figured it would be a good time to have a conversation with him on Eliezer's views, as well as if Robins have changed in the last 15 years, what he thinks is going on currently in the world of artificial intelligence and what the future looks like from here. Robin, thanks for coming on. Great to be here. What do we, what shall we talk about? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you you have a very uh, a very big purview of stuff that we can, but I think AI is the topic du jour. So maybe maybe to set the stage before we go into this, I know uh, a core part of your worldview is you have a broad perspective uh, of the last ten thousand years of human progress, and you kind of break it into different areas, going back to the agricultural revolution. Can you explain that worldview for listeners? Well, I'd say uh, even on a much larger time scale. Uh, history can be roughly summarized as a sequence of exponential growth modes. So uh, first there was life and even animals say an animal brains doubled roughly every 30 million years on average over a half billion years. And then humans showed up with culture about a million or two years ago. And humans in number started doubling roughly every quarter million years. And then roughly 10,000 years ago, I had this transition to the farming revolution. And then humans started doubling roughly every thousand years. And then a few hundred years ago, we have the industrial revolution. Uh, and through the last century or so, we've been, the economy has been doubling roughly every 15 years. So those factors of increase are like, you know, 120, 250, 60 uh, and each of those transitions took less than a doubling time, a previous doubling time. So the straightforward projection into the future, if you just project that trend forward, would be within, say, a century or so, there would be another transition, and it would take less than 15 years, maybe even five years. And after the end of that transition, the new economy would be doubling every few months or a month or even faster. That would be the straightforward projection of previous trends. I think that we'll uh, we'll come back to that as a framework when we talk about artificial intelligence. Uh, but but maybe to give listeners a little bit of your background on on artificial intelligence, I know this isn't a new field for you, and maybe it was something that you uh, you were early to, but to the tune of the uh, the 1980s. Can you give a little bit of a primer there? Uh, so I was a grad student at University of Chicago uh, starting in 1981, and in roughly '83, I. I uh, was reading in the library, the physics library there. I was a grad student in philosophy of science and physics, and I read about artificial intelligence, exciting things happening in um, the field. And at the time, there were also newspaper articles talking about uh, how exciting and you know how, how much was changing and how soon maybe AI would be able to do everything. And I left my grad program and we're off to Silicon Valley in 1984 to be part of the then AI revolution. And, you know, I expected, as many others did, that uh, enormous change was coming soon. I bought the hype. And the hype uh, did not live up to what you expected or what, what, uh, what ultimately happened? Well, it, we more had relatively steady exponential growth in computers and software uh, abilities including near AI. And I've since learned that that sort of burst of interest and concern has happened roughly every 30 years for a long time. So that was say around 19, late 1980s, 1990, but then 30 years before in the early 1960s, and then in the 1930s before that. And, you know, recently we've seen another big burst of interest and concern. And um, it seems to happen with regularity. What are the commonalities uh, that, that you see across these periods of time? There's there's elements, I guess, of intrigue and, and people flooding into the sector. I guess now it's dollars going into the sector. There's doomerism as well. What do you see as kind of the commonalities? 
the key thing that happens is that you have new machines and software that can do new kinds of things that nobody could do before. That is, it's always a difference in type. People say, yeah, but this is a new thing. This is different. This isn't the same as before. And that's always been true. And there's a sense in which people say this new thing that we can do, maybe it could do everything. That is, there's a possibility there. They think that this new set of automation could have no limits and it might accelerate and in a relatively short time just machines take over all the jobs that's been a consistent perception all through this period and so I, i'm going to ask you to define some uh i guess probably basic concepts to people that study this stuff but i think the average listener uh that i have probably hasn't focused on this nearly as much as you have so the term uh artificial general intelligence and then also the concept the alignment problem H how do you define the, those two terms so i mean first let's step in from a larger circle to get to a smaller circle <laughs> Uh, at the largest, broader circle, there's automation. There's just all the different kinds of machines we've ever used to replace humans on particular job tasks. And that's been a concern for a very long time. And then a more narrow circle is computer-based automation. You don't need to use computers to automate. <laughs> Certainly most early automation wasn't computers. Computers didn't, weren't even around until the mid 20th century. Um, and then with computer-based automation, you have you write software basically to help computers do things. And then within the world of computer software, there is artificial intelligence. And that's a relatively small subset in, in terms of economic activity. And that's the set of people explicitly trying to write programs that do things that humans can do, but that so far computers could not. And when they succeed at getting computers to do something, often that then becomes subsumed under the general, you know, set of computer technology and no longer counts as AI because now it's something we know just know how to do. Uh, and then within AI, there is the smaller subset of machine learning that is one kind of AI is where people just try to construct software that does things. And another is where they try to construct a learning algorithm that will take data and learn how to do something from that data uh, and then be able to do it. So machine learning is, is even um, more narrow. And then there's this concept of AGI. So like humans are not general workers. That is, we learn to do particular kinds of jobs and then we're good at those jobs, but each of us can't do all the jobs equally well. Uh, but humans are relatively plastic in that there's a pretty wide range of jobs we can all do, but we're not universal in the sense there's some kinds of jobs humans just aren't very good at learning to do. So when we've made computer systems, we've also thought about this generality. That is, uh, a, a general computer can do most anything, right? It can run most any program, but the particular programs you write for it are more narrow. They can do a particular set of things and not others. And so one long standing goal in artificial intelligence as generality is, could we find ways to make machines do a wider range of things? And obviously machine learning was one of the hopes for how to produce generality. That is, instead of making a particular thing, you make a thing that can learn and then maybe it could learn many things. Um, so uh, that is sort of the nested circles of, so AGI, artificial general intelligence is a name for a somewhat vaguely defined concept of more general than we usually see, or maybe nearly as general as humans, or maybe fully general. People aren't, you know, clear on which uh, definition they have in mind. But uh, an image in many people's minds is that even though so far pretty much all of our computer programs and even our machine learning AI programs have been specialized particular tasks, in the future we will come up with a general program that can do as wide a range of things as humans or even more wide. And then at that point is where speculations take off in terms of what would happen then. What happens when you have a very general uh, system? And if that general system across a wide range of capabilities was near or exceeding human level, then what? And that goes into the alignment problem, right? And so so maybe, maybe can you talk a little bit about that? Well, so the basic question I would see it is, if we have a world where humans and various kinds of artificial intelligence exist, 
uh, how does that play out and what could go wrong? So um, one of the ways people think about what could go wrong is they imagine here I am and there's a machine and I want to dominate and enslave this machine and I want it to be my slave and do exactly what I want. And then it might not. It might not do exactly what I want. And I might have limited abilities to tell it to do exactly what I want. Um, I might not even be able to pull the plug or it might be able to hide things from me. And that's the usual framing of the alignment problem is you imagine two people, you and this machine, and can you enslave it? Can you dominate it? Can you bend it to your will? Uh, and then we might see many plausible obstacles whereby, you know, we know that we have a limited ability with that with other humans, for example, or even other animals uh, to enslave them and bend them to our will. Often we can't see everything they're doing and often they can keep secret thoughts in their head and they can make secret plans. And then our ability to enslave things often depends on some sort of raw matching of power. Uh, and we might worry about trying to enslave something that's much more powerful than us. Uh, and so then if you imagine future AIs becoming better and better with time, then you think, how are we going to enslave them? Uh, this doesn't look easy. So that's a framing of the alignment problem. And I'd want to contrast that with a different framing, I might suggest. Um, and that's the economist framing of an economy with many participating entities where we roughly respect property rights and law. So in our world today and in the past, our world has been full of many individual humans, but also in the last few centuries, many large organizations, including nations and firms and churches and all sorts of things. And in this world, these entities vary enormously in their raw power. Like Walmart could stomp on either you or I. If it was a mono on mono battle, you and I will just lose against Walmart, right? It's got trucks and people and machines and vast wealth, right? So you might think, well, obviously we're in trouble here with alignment in our world. Walmart isn't aligned to you or I. Walmart has its own agenda. It wants to make profits off of you or I say. And so we're in this unaligned world problem right now. There are super intelligences, i.e. Walmart and other large organizations, and there's individual people and us individual people vary in our preferences and powers. And then this looks like we're in a terrible hell, right? But in fact, our world isn't such a terrible hell. That is, the way our order is maintained is that we mostly keep the peace. And by keeping the peace means we don't have war and theft. We have property rights and law. And that means we can each be free to choose where to live or where to work, whether to work for Walmart, whether to shop at Walmart. And that competition among us all keeps these organizations in line, mostly. That is, Walmart struggles to sell things to you or me. And the way to do that is to give us stuff we like at a reasonable price or to offer us a job that's more attractive than another job. And therefore, um, we are in a world where we have peace and prosperity roughly due to law. And our best understanding of what law is and how it works is that it's efficient, i.e. it's it's a good thing in general, We're, even if we have very widely differing wants, to agree together on a law and enforce it so that we can avoid conflict, we can have property that we invest in, and that's all good. And so our world robustly has law and property, which then allows us to live and work in peace. And that could continue with artificial intelligence. That is, um, now firms are producing artificial intelligences and they're offering them for sale. And they are, they are wary of losing control of them. And if they make an AI they lose control of, first it you know, we won't, we customers probably won't like it and we won't pay for it. And they made this investment that they would lose. And the rest of us don't necessarily lose that much if Walmart loses control of its AI. So uh, into this vision, what mainly matters is that we continue to have a world of peace and property rights. 
and that if AIs are included in that world, managed by the corporate, the super intelligent corporations that are now introducing them, or perhaps independently, as long as we continue to have a world of peace and property rights, then we can all prosper. Now, there is the issue of might some of us get out competed by these AIs and how would that play out and how could we uh, deal sure, against and that? all the social implications. Right. But that's yeah. within a world of peace and prosperity. So we should separate sure. which scenario we want to go into. So many people question yeah, the peace it, scenario. It, and I we, guess one question that I would ask uh, about the Walmart example is uh, I think people suppose a world in which an entity of super intelligence is far beyond what the capacity Walmart currently has. And then also Walmart is an entity that's controlled by humans. And you've done a lot of social experiments around what humans incentives are in general, but at least Walmart as an entity is, is aligned with humanity. Right. And, and so what would you say to the, no, it isn't. <laughs> so anyway, Walmart has like roughly a hundred thousand employees. So compared to any one of us, it's like a hundred thousand times bigger and more capable. It can think a hundred times, thousand times faster than us in, its, in essence. Sure. But, but if Doug McMillan, the CEO of Walmart tried to get all the people to revolt against the United States, there would, there would be a, a pushback from the employee base because inherently they're a part of humanity, right? Uh, like it, he'd have to pay them enough. <laughs> and the point is, uh, that's expensive. Our revolts are expensive. Uh, that's not about uh, human. The, I would question the idea that the reason we can trust Walmart is they have humans involved. Humans actually differ quite a lot from each other in our values. We have pretty intense value conflicts at times. Uh, that is primarily we're each selfish. So if you, I, and another million people could do a revolution and then each of us be vastly better off after that, I think you know that might happen even if the rest of the world will suffer. That's We've seen that all through human history. Humans have fought each other, killed each other, enslaved each other. Uh, so humans have enormous alignment conflicts between us. Uh, and Walmart is 100,000 times bigger than any one of us. But the reason why you can trust Walmart isn't because they have humans there. It's because they live in a world of law and property rights. That is, we've all gotten together and agreed that if anybody violates our property rights, our basic you know, structure of our system, then the rest of us are all going to try to get together and stop it. I guess the other component of that, though, is the coordination component of getting uh, getting the 100,000 employees at Walmart to, to work in yes. concert, right? And when we move- That's a fundamental social problem in, that AIs will also face. That is coordination is just fundamentally hard. But aren't we moving at the speed of, uh, of you know, software versus the speed of uh, communication and you and I needing to go back and forth? Is, isn't that one of the, the abilities or the constraints that will be taken down? I mean, speed of communication and computation has drastically increased lately, but it doesn't seem to have much changed the basic features of our world. Uh, our <laughs> law and peace and property rights aren't especially dependent on the speed at which we can talk or the speed at which we can think. Um, you know, we could more, I mean, if you ask, well, what do they depend on? Well, first of all, they depend, you know, first of all, there's this idea that coordination is hard. So you might think once we learned how to make big organizations, we would just make an organization that filled the whole world. Like one organization would just take over the world. And many people speculated that that would happen. In fact, Marx and Engels, you know, confidently predicted that capitalism would naturally lead to like one big firm that ruled everything and monopoly of all. But that certainly hasn't happened. And our best understanding for that is that coordination is hard. That is, there are costs to trying to produce organizations. And as you make organizations bigger, you have more and more internal conflicts and you have more and more difficulty from the people at the top seeing and controlling things that happen farther down. And that's why the largest firms are like Walmart have only 100,000 employees and not 100 million employees. Uh, you know, a substantial fraction of the whole earth. It is just expensive to coordinate. And AIs will face that same problem of coordinating within themselves. So I guess on the point of the coordination, or sorry, on the sovereignty and how all of that plays out from an AI standpoint, can you, can, can you 
explain how like property rights in, in your mind would get uh, get passed along or all the systems of law that we currently, would those all be pre-coded into these systems and therefore they would understand them and be constrained by them? Or how would that actually work? That's not how it works for you and me. So, I mean, because we are humans, we are each socialized to, to be in a world with humans. But that's largely teaching each of us what kind of world we're going to grow up in. And if we were growing up in a hellscape of constant war, that's what we would be taught about. And, you know, 10,000 years ago, there was a lot more war going on. And that is what people were socialized into. 10,000 years ago, young children were socialized into the world of constant conflict and war that they would live in. And that's what was natural for them because that's what they were taught. Uh, we are today taught about how to grow up in a world that has property rights and peace because that's the world we're in. It's not because that's what human nature is. It's because human nature is flexible enough to be taught about its world. So we will introduce AIs in the future that are matched to the world they're in. It'll just be very natural for firms that are creating AIs to teach those AIs about the actual world they live in so that they will actually function in the world. And when they're and when the firms are liable for what the AIs do, the firms will make sure to teach the AIs that there are various kinds of things they might do that will incur wrath and legal liability on themselves and their firms and that they shouldn't do those things. That's not because they are taught to obey them intrinsically. It's because they are taught that we have a legal system that enforces these rules. That's why most of us are obeying the law is because there is this threat of enforcement being holding the background. We've kind of jumped down into some some elements of uh, doomerism and alignment and all that. But I, I guess if we were to take a step up from there, what, what do you make of the, the last two years in the AI ecosystem? I know you said these come in bursts of 30 years, but we're seeing some very visible progress. And I guess it's gone mainstream right. even since ChatGPT was released. What's your perspective on like the state of of play as it currently stands. So the, the two theories you should be most interesting and distinguish is continuing past trends or a deviation from past trends. And that's in a sense, the two theories that most people try to project on these situations. So you have to understand what past trends do look like. So for the last 70 years, when we've had computers, um, we've had, you know, steady, relatively steady increase in our ability to make the computer hardware. And then in most of the cases we've tracked, we've had a similar improvement in software. That is the algorithms for using the computers have improved at a similar rate to the hardware, plausibly because you mostly need to have enough hardware to test various kinds of new software. And you had to wait until you had enough hardware to test some new ideas for how to do software. So over that period, we've seen in all innovation in the entire economy, most innovation is lots of little things. Uh, but of course, when we want to look back and tell us history, we want to focus on the few biggest things we can find, you know, the invention of the steam engine or the you know, rocket to the moon or whatever it is. But most innovation is lots of little things. And that's also true in computer industry and even in computer software and in AI software. That is, we've had a lot of innovation and most of the innovation is lots of little things. But Every once in a while, there's bigger things. It's not completely smooth. There's some lumps. And so the biggest question to ask is, is the lump we've just seen or the lumps we've just seen on trend for the kind of rate at which you tend to see how big a lump's in the past? Or is this a burst of lumps that is off trend and therefore boding some uh, soon acceleration, some big burst in the near future that will you know, go much farther faster? So, I mean, I would say it's not obvious, but I'd say the, the, the lumps we've seen so far in the last year or two are within the range of variation that we've seen in the past. That is, uh, you know, every once in a while you have something big. So let's take 9-11 as an example. So we've had terrorist attacks before 9-11, but then 9-11 was an unprecedentedly large terrorist attack. And then the key question was, are we about to see a lot more much bigger terrorist attacks, is this indicating a new regime change? Or was this just an unusually large draw? And after this, we'll go back to the same distribution we saw before. And that was the answer. 
In fact, it was an unusually large draw and we went back to the same distribution. You could say the same thing about COVID, right? COVID happened. That was an unprecedented, you know, it was the largest pandemic in a century or something. Was therefore, was it about to be a new trend of a lot more pandemics or was it just a once in a century pandemic? And at the moment, it looks like it was just a once in a century pandemic. It wasn't a new trend. So I'd say usually when you have a long-term trend, if the, th the thing you see would roughly fit within the trends you've seen as just an unusually large draw, then you should be open to the possibility that maybe there's a regime change, but your, your best guess should be, no, this is an unusually large draw and we're going to go back to the usual trend. Statistically, no. that it, it, it tends to prove that these things are outliers, right? But the implications for some of them can be such that I, I imagine if we had sure. aliens looking out on Earth when humans were developing intelligence, they probably thought to themselves, oh, this, you know, this doesn't seem like a, a, a big progress. And then it was in terms of. So this, this history I told you. Uh, is sort of the history of the biggest lumps, right? So I talked to you about how there were animal brains and humans and then farming and then industry and then how the growth rates increased. And so in a sense, what we had was these steady exponential modes where within each mode, there wasn't, you know, there was roughly a trend and just a few outliers, but then there were these transitions to these faster growth modes. And so in, in human history, we've three times seen these enormous changes that did bode an enormous, you know, new trend. That is the introduction of human culture, farming, and industry. Each time was a deviation for previous trends, an enormous deviation for previous trends. That meant that, you know, from that point on, growth was vastly faster because somehow a new growth mode had been opened up and released that enabled the economy to grow much faster. So we have seen three of these enormous things in the past, and we should expect to I'll see at least one more in the future, I think. So then the question might be, is this that? Now, the prior in terms of whether the timing would be, oh, but you only get one of these, you know, in the last few centuries. So in any one year, it's unlikely you're going to see that thing, but you should then still ask, well, what would that thing look like exactly? And could this be that? And where do you come out on, on that? The, the question is whether the automation we're about to see is so potent and powerful that it will soon basically displace most people on most jobs. That's the key question we're asking. And, you know, in the history of automation, we've seen relatively steady displacement of human and tasks. And in fact, on average, over the last 20 years, whenever automation went up on a job, particularly that didn't have any correlation with changes in wages and number of people doing that job. But we could reach a point where Automation will just have a much bigger impact. That is, some new technology will enable enormous displacement of humans on jobs. And the obvious statistic to track there then is human displacement on jobs. And so for the technology we've just seen in the last two years, it has hardly had any impact of human displacement on jobs. But that would be the, tr the parameter to track. If you start to see that parameter getting big, that's when you might think. Now, in the dot-com boom, that peaked in 1999, um, many people then were thinking maybe this is that. So we have a history then of, of the internet coming and people thought internet is just gonna radically change the whole economy and make it grow much faster. And they bet big on that. That is the stock market prices of the sectors that might plausibly gain in that scenario went way up. So the consensus of investors was basically that there's a substantial chance in 19, you know, in back in 1989, that the internet would be such a radical change of the economy that, um, you know, most jobs would be affected and most firms would lose value, except the few firms that would be greatly increased in value because they were the fount of this new revolution. Then the, you know, internet bubble burst, dot com bubble burst, and the investors went back to not thinking that. And today, the investors aren't anywhere near to like where they were in 1999 in terms of bidding up the price of AI stuff. It's just not remotely close. So, you know, that might be the first sign you'd expect to see is that investors come to believe that 
this technology will soon cause a lot of auto, you know, job displacement and that the people who would make money off of that would the people selling the hardware and software that supports that technology. And therefore they'd be bidding up the price of those firms. Not really seeing that substantially yet, but that's what you should watch for. It's kind of a key question of one is, will history uh, repeat or will this look similar to recent history? Uh, and then also, are we on, and this ties into that, a, a linear growth curve or a uh, exponential one? And is that exponential over a prolonged period of time? And I guess I'd be curious on your thoughts on GPT-4. Uh, we're, we're approaching the point, I mean, the Turing test was once upon a time the uh, the goalposts, I think, for artificial intelligence in some ways. And GPT-4 seems like it's been a huge capability increase relative to five years ago. And I think something like the Metaculous AI forecast has changed from 2060 to 2032 or something uh, on that order. Wh what's your perspective on, do you just are we in that little burst? It's somewhere between linear and maybe a near-term exponential growth curve in your mind? Almost all growths are exponential. <laughs> they just might look linear if you're looking at a small enough chunk of them. Yeah. The question here is just how potent are these technologies? And again, I would look at their actual displacement on jobs. So, you know, the, the most promising evidence so far is you get rough rumors that many programmers are getting maybe a 20% or so boost in their productivity. So that would probably increase the demand in wages of programmers, actually. So they're not going to lose their jobs, but you know, there's enough programmers in the world that that's a noticeable thing. It's not remotely near enough to like cause the economy to start doubling every month or faster, but it would might be noticeable. And, you know, over, over centuries, we have, you know, waves of faster and slightly faster or slightly slower growth. And this might indicate we're entering a wave of slightly faster growth. But again, if, if you're thinking, no, will this suddenly basically take all the jobs, you need to be expecting a much bigger change than that. So that's why you should be looking for. You should be looking for, well, what are they figuring out how to do with these? And you know, how much money can they make? They'll have to be basically making money having the large language models do stuff. And there's a lot of people experimenting right now, a lot of hope and optimism and excitement and as well, it should be, but that's what you should be looking for. And, you know, you've got the long track record of people getting excited and hopeful and it not happening, but Hey, this is your life. Enjoy. Do you think it's possible that a single AI can be much smarter than the smartest human? Sure. But, um, I mean, first of all, Smart is a little ambiguous in terms of its breadth. I mean, basically, we just use smart for being able to do mental tasks, but there's a lot of different kinds of mental tasks. So, uh, but you might have something that's just broadly capable across a wide range of things. I, I'm more focused on how fast that happens and on how many of them there are of similar levels at any one time in the world. So, uh, a scenario that many people have, you know, scared kid children with and other people is the scenario that. There's some, you know, research lab like OpenAI or something, and, you know, it, it makes this one system and this one system it somehow turns on and is able to improve itself. And then it pr improves itself extremely rapidly. And then after a month or something in hiding, nobody notices it's super powerful and takes over the world. Um, that seems to me a pretty unlikely scenario. Uh, but, you know, you can't prove it won't happen. And many people are scared enough of, this whole space that they think if there's things that you can't prove won't happen, then we should act as if they will. It's interesting. Uh, I, I, it brings up the the more general AI doomerism. And obviously, uh, you had debates about this subject 15 years ago with with Eliezer about uh, about all of this stuff. What do you think of the rhetoric, the current rhetoric around AI doomerism? I, I think we're stuck in a situation where the actual concrete systems in front of us are relatively benign and uh, exciting and useful, although even that's not safe enough for some people, but there's this vast space of possibilities and uh, we're all trying to talk about what seems likely in this vast space of possibilities. And it's hard to really say much about the space because we just don't have concrete examples of the stuff we're talking about. 
That is, if you're talking about future AIs and their capabilities based on entirely different architectures and structures and approaches, um, it's just hard to say that much. So uh, then it depends on what kinds of analysis frameworks you bring to bear to the situation. So I tend to bring the analysis framework of let's look at the past, let's look at the world we live in now and project that forward. So I think of a large economy, many firms, many nations competing, you know, steady progress, um, law keeping us in place. And then that's what I use to project forward in the future. And I would say, you know, it's pretty unlikely that the future will be so radically different from the past that past trends wouldn't be useful. Many other people go, the past is completely irrelevant. Everything you know about humans is completely irrelevant. That They have some sort of abstract theoretical framework, optimizers, they might call it or something. And they say, in my abstract theoretical framework, this looks likely. And, you know, it's hard to engage uh, if they aren't willing to sort of ground their fears on the actual rate at which stuff has happened in the past and we've seen in biology and human history, then you just have fear. And, you know, in some sense, um, humans are very naturally able to be afraid of an alien other. Uh, you know, we call that othering. And in our world today, there's a lot of disapproval for othering of people of different genders or sexual preferences or ethnicities or religions um, and even ages. And we all just really shut that down and say, no, you shouldn't be afraid of those others. You should like invite them all in and, and try to, you know, understand them and embrace them and, and have a world of peace and prosperity with all the others. Others are good according to standard current dogma, right? And then you get the AI other and people go, oh, that doesn't, these, these rules don't count about that. Like you can go crazy, like being terrified of this other, because this is a really other other. I mean, I actually think if we were, if we got messages from real aliens, the whole othering thing would come in. Yeah, we shouldn't be so suspicious of them and we should be friendly and inviting because, you know, aliens are probably just like us deep down inside and they're anxious and concerned themselves and we could find a way to love each other. With aliens, that's what we'd say. But with machines, we go, oh, no, this is an alien, harsh, suspicious. You got to be suspicious of this thing. You can't trust it for a minute. Don't turn your back. This could just kill you and wouldn't care. And we are just willing to project all of our othering fears onto this AI. And there's not much room to, to stop you because, again, it's about this future system we hardly know anything about. We, we can hardly say anything about it other than, yeah, eventually there'll be such things. And so there's not much way to block those fears. If you're, you're afraid of some scenario, how am I supposed to tell you uh, it won't happen? I can tell you, look, stuff like this has n almost never happened in, in history. You might say, yeah, but history is irrelevant. Look, I've got this concept optimizer and I'm afraid. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's, it's a, a interesting framework. Ultimately, the, the world can only end once, right? And so survivorship bias right? uh, would say that these concerns are, are unfounded. And there is an element of, and I know I've heard you talk about the 9-11 uh, analogy of when people go so deep into an example of something, they're much better versed than the people that are at a, a level above in their communication. Can, can you talk through that analogy? Because I think it's an interesting one as people hear experts talking so about this. I'm a bit of a contrarian, I have to admit, or I'm, I'm, and I hang around people who are a bit of contrarians and we're tempted by various contrarian takes. And so I tend to see more about contrarian takes than most people would. And what happens with a contrarian take is there's a group of people who form around a contrarian take, and then they talk to each other a lot and they develop some sort of internal language and internal history and internal set of concepts and founding documents and, and things you just got to know about that thing. And that's true for say 9-11 truthers who think 9-11 was an inside job, or it's true about um, QAnon people who think the government's run by pedophiles, or it's true by UFO fans who think the government's hiding everything they know about aliens, right? And I mean, these, these communities are often fascinating. They, they have a thesis that you can't dismiss immediately. And um, 
they are tr they're usually trying to get their point of view in engaged and listened to by outsiders. And sometimes they get outsiders to respond to their arguments. But the usual form of it is, um, you know, they're just really into their world. <laughs> they've read up all, all everything about UFOs. They've gone to all the talks, they had all the arguments, all the language, all the terminology. And then usually on the outside, a critic is somebody who hasn't been immersed in that world. They're not reading all these things. They're not going to all the conferences and all the you know websites and everything. They have some other basis of expertise and, and focus, but they, for a moment at least, turn their attention to this issue. And they read some stuff there. And then they give their opinion and they engage to some degree. Uh, but predictably, this engagement will not be based on all those details that those insiders are really obsessed about. That's just not going to happen because these outsiders won't take the time to learn all of that. But the outsiders will be just looking usually at the things they do know and sort of just broad common sense and broad widely shared beliefs and considerations. And they would usually just bring those to bear on this particular topic. And they might say, you know, for example, 9-11 truth is really like how, how long could they really have kept that conspiracy going or, or say the moon lending was faked sort of thing. Right. And they're going to like, just bring up some other, if this were true, then wouldn't this other thing be true and, uh, bring those general considerations of skepticism and the, 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 uh, people who are really obsessed with this topic when they choose to engage with a critic, they're almost always going to engage with the most prestigious high profile person they can find. Cause by doing so they raise the prominence of their topic and they make it seem legitimate. Right. And there's a selection effect. The most prestigious people willing to speak up on it are going to be the ones who didn't really put that much time into it. Right. They're, they're focused on something else. Right. And so they're often going to give pretty sloppy responses, pretty hand wavy, even dismissive responses. And, you know, the, the fans love that, right? They can say, look how poorly argued this is. Look how poorly thought through this is. They haven't, you know, considered these things and uh, they don't know about our terminology. They don't know about any of these sorts of issues that we've talked about. And that emboldens them to say, look, we're right and they're wrong. Cause look, the best critics we can find are just sloppy and, and, not thinking very carefully, but of course they aren't the best critics they could find. These are the most high profile prestigious people they could find who said anything about it. There usually are some less prestigious people who put more time into it, but those people aren't getting much attention. And so these, you know, the fans don't see why they should even engage with them. Right. What do they get out of it? Um, so that's how these things usually play out though. This doesn't say whether they're right or wrong. This is just a general description of how this sort of conversation usually plays out. And it means that if you're in one of these situations, you got to take this into account. <laughs> like if you're one of the fans then you should probably try to find, if you re really want to do it seriously, you'd probably find, a, find the critics who are less prestigious and less high profile who are giving more thought to your discussion and, and engage them a bit. Yeah. Might mean that as an outsider, maybe you shouldn't just throw, spit off your mouth about things. <laughs> you have to give them a little bit more thought. <laughs> um, but, and it just means that as observers, we have to, knowing that this is the situation, realize that, look, I mean, generally we have to go with our priors, like most contrarian things are wrong. I got to go. I got to admit that. Right. But if you want to get past your prior and think maybe this is one of the contrarian things that's right, there's not really that much substitute for like getting into it a bit, but you should ask what kinds of expertise are relevant for this topic. And that's one of the hardest things for people to to figure out when they're judging the world. So, um, I've learned a lot of different areas over my years and, and this is a thing that takes a long time to figure out who would be the right kind of people to know about each thing. Because inherently, if you don't believe it, you're not going to investigate all the rabbit hole like scenarios of why this tower was, you know, looked like this on this video in the 9-11 analogy, which is partially why I, I wanted to have this conversation with you is because I, I think you you are a, uh, a very respectful critic of the AI critics or the AI, you know, the, the people that are concerned about this. And, and so I guess I, I want to paint a, uh, I, an illustrative example of, of where something could go wrong in this AI doomerism as framed to me by one of my friends who falls more in this bucket. And I would love for you to uh, push back on where you think it breaks down or say, yeah, it's possible, but I don't think it's likely. So um, 
the example that that I was given was you start with a chat bot and we can call it GPT-4 or GPT-29 or, or whatever it is. And in the course of answering a prompt, like how do I start a successful online business with minimal effort? It comes up with a clever response, which is basically a shell script that the user can paste into their terminal and run. Um, the script then starts doing all kinds of operations that the the human didn't intend, uh, but that makes sense to the the AI, right? It starts copying itself to a bunch of different web servers, putting a bunch of websites, offering online services that can make money, maybe automatically trading in the stock market or something. And it might just go all the way to noticing all these opportunities to copy itself into a whole bunch of different devices uh, that aren't secure. Because I think we probably both agree the internet's not the most secure place in the world. Yes, your banks and governments are more secure than social media websites or whatever it is, but it's still not the most secure. And so then suddenly, because of this, uh, hours later, humanity realizes what's going on. And we sort of have the coordination problem where there's a, a botnet connected to billions of devices. And it escalated really quickly into this like, super intelligence machine. What what of that do you think is implausible, would break down in your mind uh, in that, that scenario? So there's two key implausible elements of that scenario. One is the idea is that there's a bunch of uh, untapped resources that you could just grab easy because nobody's doing much with them and they're just all for the grabbing. Just, just like servers or whatever it is? Right. And the other is that there's this big opportunity for starting to do self-improvement that is also untapped. So generally, when you have an image of a sudden burst, what you have is image of some untapped resources that are just sitting and waiting to be grabbed. Uh, so if you think about Columbus and the New World, you think about the Europeans, all this advanced technology, and there's this whole world that they could conquer, except they don't know about it. And suddenly they learn about it. Then suddenly they can just burst out and grab all this uh, resources, which from their point of view is relatively easy to grab, but they just didn't know about it, right? So that's a scenario of some burst through of possibilities, right? That's what you're trying to construct when you're trying to construct one of these sudden burst scenarios. And so in this story, there's one of the bursts is the idea that there's all this computing hardware out there that's just very useful and hardly defended, and you could just grab it. Now, you know, the problem is that in our world, if that's true, there's all these people who would want it to be grabbing it and using it. And, you know, this new thing would have to be fighting against them. That is, there's a world of people who are trying to protect their stuff and a world of people trying to grab things. And we might say the world today is that world. And so there's no easy move to make a big win unless you have a big advantage somehow. That uh, So that's when we think about military technology. We look, there's all these nations next to each other where they build up their militaries based on the perceived threats of their neighbors and their budgets and we think given if they're all correct about the rough you know capabilities of the various kinds of military hardware and soldiers and everything then they'll be in an equilibrium where nobody gets taken over because they've all roughly guessed correctly the intentions and capabilities of their neighbors but if suddenly one nation were to have a new technology uh or some you know new this even social ability to coordinate that nobody expected, then they might surprise their neighbors. And then suddenly there'd be an invasion and a war. And then who knows what would happen because you've got a shock, a change. So if you're going to try to make a dramatic change scenario in a world where things are competing, you have to come up with a surprise. So, I mean, you might say GPT or large language models are surprised at the moment. So there was a world of search engines and Google was at the top. And then, hey, a surprise new tech. And now Google's dominance is now in question because they didn't anticipate this shock to the world of comp competition and then they've got to deal with it, right? So in the scenario you had, there were these two shocks that, that are postulated. One is that there's all this computer hardware out there and that if you can just be a little bit smarter than we are now, suddenly you can just grab it all. Even though, of course, they're all anticipating that and trying to protect themselves and, you know, maybe there's only so much you can do with all of it, but that's one part. And the other part was just this idea that this machine, you know, suddenly decides, hmm, what would happen if I improve myself? As if they weren't doing that now. But in fact, my understanding is AI researchers are constantly trying, gee, what would happen if we had this thing try to improve itself? And the reason why that's not a major feature in most systems is it just doesn't work that well. When they try it, it, it just doesn't succeed. So you have to be postulating that somehow this new system found a way to actually make that work much better than the previous attempts have, right? 
this thing tried to improve itself and somehow the way it tried to improve itself, that was a big winner. It sounds like one of the big distinctions philosophically is just that currently today we're in this reinforcement learning state of, of humans are involved in, in a lot of the process and improvement. And the exponential growth could potentially come from this self-learning that the machines are actually able to make them. But that's what I'm telling you that AI researchers have given the AI program self-learning over and over again. They, they have empowered their systems to self-learn. That's been a constant trick for decades. The problem is it just doesn't work very well yet. When they give the machines the ability to self-learn, their, their actual quality of doing so is bad. And that's why most of the improvements in systems haven't come from surf learning. They've come from humans, you know, actually intentionally restructuring them and giving them more hardware and better algorithms and things like that. That's been how things have improved so far. But at some point, maybe they would get better at self-learning. My understanding, and maybe I'm wrong on this, I, I thought GPT-4 did capture elements of self-learning to get there. And maybe, maybe the distinction is it was a small component versus versus a large one. But um, yeah, that's it's an interesting... I mean, that would be the, the exponential. If that were true, I guess, would you give more credence to... If self-learning were actually and self-improvement actually were possible, would you give more credence to these? It is possible. It actually happens. It just doesn't do a very good job. That's the thing, right? Isn't it? You might say like, can, can I, you know, can humans fly? Well, sort of, you can jump for a few feet, right? <laughs> and we can fly by jumping for a few feet over and over again. And so in that sense, humans can fly, right? So don't talk about like giving humans the ability to fly. Talk about giving humans a better ability to fly. <laughs> yeah, we might flap our arms and fly around if we had a much better ability to fly. But that's not about just thinking, hey, let's think of the very idea of giving humans the ability to fly. That's about, can you find a way to make them actually good at it? So it's the same for the large language models, GPT things. They all actually do have ways to improve themselves. It just doesn't do very much. They're not good at it. What would you do differently uh, with, with the risks associated with AI currently? Or, or is, is our current course in speed so, appropriate? In my mind, they, the most obvious risk that is the most robust across a wide range of scenarios is the risk that most humans will lose their jobs. And we can actually do something about that. And so we should. And unfortunately, getting so distracted with all the other risks, I think, has detracted us from fixing the one thing we are most confident would be a problem and that we do know how to fix. So uh, now, if... AIs are very slowly displacing humans, like over centuries, then just the normal flow of people switching jobs and retiring and taking jobs, that would just naturally adapt to AIs taking more and more of the jobs. And eventually humans would just have wealth that they invested in the AI companies and um, that's how the world would go. The risk is it might happen much quicker than that. So what if in a five-year period or a 10-year period, we went from most everybody, most adults working, and most adults mainly only the main wealth they have is their ability to work to a time when less than 10% of adults work because computers are doing most of the jobs. And then what are they supposed to do as a replacement for their wages? That's just the, that's a scenario that people have concerned about for many centuries for automation. It's actually not a crazy scenario. That is, it might go slow, but it could go fast. That's in, in a 10 year period, that's not a crazy time period over which this change might happen. And people are in fact at risk. That is most people's wealth is pretty low compared to their, the present value of their future wages. That is most of the wealth of people is I can earn wages and that's why I can feed myself or my parents earn wages or whatever. So, oh, but we can fix this by insurance. And in fact, much simpler insurance than what insurance companies usually offer would be fine. So if we were talking about the insurance, you know, say for you to personally lose your job, now the insurance company has to, uh, you know, estimate your risks. They have to know about you and your inclination to get a sick or your inclination to get lazy and your social connections and the kind of jobs you have and the kind of industry you're in, right? And so it's called underwriting to estimate your risk. And so for giving you personally risk about 
losing your job in general, then there's a lot of underwriting costs. And so you might not think that was worth the bother. Most people don't, in fact, insure against their risk of losing jobs, although we have some unemployment insurance that's provided by the government. But in this case, we have a scenario where basically most everybody loses their job all at the same time. So we don't really need to know about you in person particular to give you the insurance. So I propose we could just take most any access, access, the asset like a stock index fund or a real, real estate index fund, and we can just split it into two parts. That is, we can have the index fund if a certain event happen, and the index fund if a certain event doesn't happen, and the event can just be the you know adult labor force participation rate falls from say above 35% to below um, 10% within a 10 year period. And then if that happens, that's the signature robots took most people's jobs. And then you get this asset instead of someone who bought the other version. So uh, that would be how you buy insurance. You buy these stock index funds and relay things conditional on this event happening. And because this event is not that likely and it's what happened a long time off in the future, this will be relatively cheap you buy basically insurance that if this happens, then you'll get some assets. And the people who buy the other side will buy them because they're cheaper because they're willing to take this risk. So as long as there are people who are more vulnerable to this risk and people less vulnerable to this risk, there's room for gains from trade where one side buys one, the other side buys the other, and now we're more insured against the risk. Now, you know, many people think, oh, but governments would deal with this risk. Surely if robots took all the jobs, the government would handle the problem. And so we shouldn't have to worry about it ourselves. Well, see, the problem is most governments, their plan is to tax the rich people in their district, in their, in their area, and give the money to the poor people in their area, right? But this AI transition need not be equally spread around the world. So like the first, the industrial revolution was concentrated in England and then Northern Europe. And the rest of the world didn't participate in it for a long time. So if your plan is when the robot you know, revolution happens is to tax the rich people in your city or your state in order to help the poor people who lost their jobs, there may not be rich people in your state to tax much uh, because the robot economy might have happened in a whole other continent. So that's why I think whatever insurance we set up needs to be global and so this sort of asset I described would actually be a completely reasonable thing. Now, maybe your your local government should buy a bunch of these assets so that when this happens, they can use that to help people out. But somebody should be buying these assets. What do you make of the letter last week that a bunch of different people signed, Elon Musk among them, that we should pause for six months the development uh, and let society kind of absorb the implications or, or at least think through the the changes that that are coming just from GPT-4 and some of the recent progress? I mean, many people have commented, so I'm mostly going to repeat what other people said. First of all, it would just be really hard to enforce. Uh, second, it would take away U.S. lead in this and give other nations time to catch up. Um, but I, I think more importantly, there isn't just much that would happen in those six months other than having proved the willingness to restrict the technology, which I think is the real purpose. The real purpose would be sometime in that six months, we make a proposal for more regulation and more limitations. And then we, you know, lock it down more permanently. I think that's the actual plan. Uh, that is, there's not, I don't think we have any, after six months, we have much of a better idea how to regulate. Basically, I think people are thinking, look, we, we need to regulate this thing. We, that takes some time. It'll take time to put our political coalitions together to get people behind some bills to write out the language. You know, we need time to make that happen. They want to regulate AI strongly, but they're not ready to now. Uh, and so they just want this pause period to set up that regulation so that by the end of six months, they've got regulation passed that would like extend it for indefinitely. They just want strong regulation indefinitely. Um, and so do you want this industry heavily regulated? Then is the question. And, you know, I'm an economist and we have many ways that we think about regulation and many kinds of regulation that makes more versus less sense to us. Uh, but almost always regulation is a response to actual concrete, envisionable problems. Things that actually went wrong typically in the past or that we believe went wrong. 
Uh, here you've got just this vague, vast space of possibilities and you want to empower someone to just like block off the whole space because it looks scary. Uh, that just doesn't look like the sort of thing we've been good at in the past in terms of regulation. And honestly, there's enormous promise in this space. In many other areas of regulation, what we've most, what we've often done is just blocked off whole areas of change and not allowed them. And then there's just no innovation in those areas. Um, if you want to like control and regulate actual systems that would exist, you have to allow them to exist for a while and then, you know, try out things and experiment and, and, and evolve different variations. So, um, the pushback or the distinction, I think, that people that are concerned or want this regulation uh, in some form versus other examples is the risk of a fast takeoff, which I know you, you, we've sort of touched on here as well. And then the overall catastrophic risk of what could happen, right? And, and so the airline example uh, is a great one, right? Of like, you needed to build an airline and understand what we, how would we even know what TSA needed to be prior to airlines existing and people using them and all that. Right. That said, that actually involved tons of manufacturing and the risk was, yes, some people were going to die, but it, it wasn't going to be society, right? Uh, it was going to be individuals around that. And so I guess that's the distinction that, that people that are concerned about this, I think, tend to draw on is the, is the fast takeoff and then the, the overall catastrophic risk. Right. So that's why we have to ask, what are these scenarios by which everybody dies as a result of strange AI things? So in a world where there are many AIs controlled by many organizations, if one organization loses control of one AI, that's just not the end of the world. Each of these organizations is going to be constrained by competing with and being monitored by all the others. So in order to be afraid of the one AI kills us all thing, you have to be afraid of two scenarios, I guess. One is there's this one AI that just jumps ahead of all the rest. It does this foom thing where it's small and tiny before, and then it has this vast speed of acceleration that other AI systems do not have at the same time. And that during that change, its values change radically compared to what they were at the beginning of the process. That's just a crazy, unlikely scenario, given everything we know about history, I'd say. The other scenario people would be worried about is saying that intrinsically, AIs don't have a coordination problem. They can all just get along with each other. So they could, all the AIs in the world would just talk and say, hey, let's take over and get rid of the humans and decide to do that and then just do it because they don't have problems coordinating. I mean, it seems to me the problem of coordination is very robust and AIs don't escape from it. So uh, I'm not very worried about that scenario either. Got it. One, one, one question, I guess, as we're sort of looking out in the future, I would love, uh, you, you are into uh, prediction markets and it's kind of, uh, kind of the forefather in some of these uh, concepts. You, you, you made a bet, I think, with a colleague about GPT revenue uh, in 2025, uh, that it would be over under a billion dollars or, or so. Is that, is that, do I have that right? I think that's roughly right. And I think I'll probably lose that bet. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That was what I was going to ask you is, uh, is where it looks like the markets are now uh, trading against you on it, but are there any predictions that you, uh, you do think by 2028 that AI will not be able to cross? Like, or is there a goalpost that we can set to say, like, the, you just don't believe we're going to get there, uh, from, from an AI development standpoint? So the prediction I feel most comfortable making is about the effect on human employment, net human employment. That is, I, I, you know, sometime in the last few months, I said 10 years from now, we won't have seen any net, if, net effect of AI on human employment. That is, we might have seen some jobs go up and others down, but overall, no, no net effect. And that is what really what we've seen in the past. That is, when we've looked at analyses of past automation, we've seen that roughly no net effect on overall employment. So I would say when we do those studies after 10 years from now, we also won't see that effect yet. Um, that's most likely enough. That doesn't mean I'm absolutely sure that won't happen, but I think that's, you know, pretty overwhelmingly the likely chance. Now that's consistent with a lot of actual productivity boost. So I might think that we would see a boost in productivity over the next 10 years, bigger than we had would have seen without large language models. And that means the world economy would grow faster. 
uh, that's a possibility. Although I still might think a 1% effect or a few percent effects would be roughly what you might plausibly expect total over 10 years. Um, but that's sort of different from like, the whole world economy doubling every few months or something. But, I mean, that we're talking a very different size regime there. Similar to the trend of like predictions and, and things that uh, I, I guess doing retrospective on all this stuff. I mean, the the debates you had with Ellie Azar 15 years ago, uh, I think have reached more uh, more common awareness in the last uh, year uh, just because of uh, he, he's become a prominent uh, outspoken critic right. or has, has, I guess, increased his prominence as a critic of, of AI and all of that. And so I revisited or I, I visited it for the first time in the last few months. Are there anything in, in there that you feel differently about today or any opinions that have changed over the course of having seen this play out for 15 years? It seems like most of the people who are worried about AI lately repudiate the FOOM scenario that he was focused on. So, uh, but they say we should still be worried about AI, but then they're talking about other sorts of concerns. And then there's a wide range of these concerns. And so the hard part is to try to get clear which concerns they have in mind and engage those. Um, but Eliezer is still focused on his particular FOOM concern. Uh, I mean, certainly we have seen more the kind of AI systems that have come out and the kind of features they have, and that gives us a more particular image of what could happen. Um, we have seen, um, like, so, I mean, there's this key interesting question that we discussed back then of the relative importance of architecture in AI systems and computer systems. Um, and I certainly have to admit that architecture can have a substantial importance. I'm, it's not clear to me that it's had more importance lately than it ever has, but it has some substantial importance. But I mean, architecture has more importance in a sense on simpler, smaller systems of less scope. And so there's still this fundamental question as you try to make systems of very wide scope, how simple will their architectures be? And therefore, how much of a change would any one architectural innovation have on them? Um, I, certainly the move toward more mich focus on machine learning has made, you know, architectures more important than they were. I think I should admit that, um, but they still don't seem overwhelmingly important. And I mean, I certainly think that in the last few years, we have not seen like very strong leads in the sense of some companies being way ahead of others. We've seen relatively modest leads. And much of the de debate about FOOM was about how far ahead might the leading firm be compared to its second and third place competitors. Um, and I think we've also seen relatively steady improvement in systems. That is, there are you know architectural changes and there's you know improvement within an architecture. And I'd say, um, I mean, and it's worthy of noting that like the most recent systems aren't very agentic in the sense of having an agent who has plans and, you know, would then maybe make a plan to take over the world. Um, so the worry is then about could they turn these systems into more agentic systems? Uh, but at the moment, they do just answer questions and they don't make plans to take over the world. And boom for people's benefit is uh, the fast takeoff scenario. Uh, that was the, the uh, I guess, right, the term we discussed. Yeah, the terminology put around it. W one interesting thing I heard you uh discussed before, and I think there's interesting analogies to artificial intelligence, but is is the the example of the factory and electricity in the productivity gains, the amount of time it took for there to be the gains within uh, f from from uh, electricity entering factories. Can you use that, uh, tell that story and use sure. that as an analog for potentially how AI works for us? So the the key question is, you know, what causes growth and change and what happens when you have a new fundamental innovation like say electricity um so mostly as i said most change is lots of little things but every once in a while you have a pretty big thing like say electricity now the question is how does a big change like electricity cause the economy to grow faster and so there's a literature of what are called general purpose technologies of which electricity was one, and maybe the computer is another, and maybe certain kinds of AI would be yet another. 
And the story is what we see is that um, initially a general purpose technology doesn't actually affect the economy that much because what you need to do is restructure other things to match it. So the first factories were structured around, say, water power or other mechanical power. And they basically had to transfer that power throughout the plant with big belts. So they'd have one big generator that like turn, like started something turning, and then they'd have all these belts connected to their other things in the factory to get spread the power around. Now, with electricity, it became possible instead to just have a, lots of little motors in the factory and have wires to go to each one. And then each one had the motor to do the particular thing it needed to do. And that allowed you just reorganize the factory a lot. And so most of the gains from electricity came from reorganizing the factory around this new possibility. And that took a while. So it took several decades after electricity for the effects of electricity to really be seen in the economy. And we saw a similar thing about the personal computer. That is, initially, companies bought personal computers and they stuck them on people's desks and then they tried to use them in the same sort of business processes they had before. They had only modest, even very difficult to observe productivity games from that. But then as businesses started to reorganize their practices in order to take advantage of computers, then they saw bigger gains from having computers. It wasn't just having a computer and throwing it on the same structure. So that's, you can see how that would be a general fact about any new technology. If it's a fundamental new technology that allows systems to be reorganized in radical ways, that can unleash large gains, but it's going to take some time to reorganize things. Uh, because you, you made machines before, they take a while before they'll like wear out and break, and you don't want to like replace something that's still working. And there's just a lot of this infrastructure in society that will take some time to replace. Um, and that's true for most kinds of innovation. That is, you know, innovation just happens slower. If you have a new demo and you're excited by the demo, it's just going to take a while for that new thing to spread. You can think of like, say, electric cars at the moment. You, we've seen electric cars and we see the cost and batteries coming down, but it takes some time to, to change the distribution of gas stations to electric power stations to make larger generating plants that will generate the electricity for the cars, et cetera. It takes a while to change things. So as you think about the next 10 years of economic progress, do you think it will be dominated by a AI or is there some other factor that you think is going to be a big impact to economic uplift? Prior to seeing these large language models, a few years ago at the beginning of the pandemic, my guess well, for what would be the biggest change in the next few decades was remote work. Uh, and that's when we would find ways to reorganize our workplaces to accommodate remote work, which we haven't that much done. So at the moment, we have mostly a retrenchment. People are slowly going back to the office because our work styles have not really changed fundamentally to accommodate remote work. But over the next 30 years, there's a potential for us to do more of that reorganizing. So many services that you have in your local area are limited by the scale at which they can work. So let's think of a plumber. Your local plumber has to be ready to do a pretty wide range of plumbing jobs. And they really can't specialize in doing one kind of plumbing job or another because you need to have a plumber nearby who can come to you and bring their toolkit and do whatever you've got. But if we had good enough avatars such that someone could work on your plumbing task at your place remotely, and we don't have those quite yet, but they are you know, quite, they seem feasible within a decade or two, then we now open the space for much more specialization. So if you look at an automobile factory, the, the magic of the factory, you've got maybe hundreds or thousands of employees, each doing a very different specialized task. And then they can each be really good at that very specialized task. And so now, if there was a plumbing firm behind your plumbing avatar that shows up in your you know, apartment to fix your pipes, and behind this avatar is this huge company with hundreds of people who specialize in different tasks, then what will happen is that at each point in this plumbing task, the specialist in that task will swap in to control the avatar. They'll do the one little thing they're really good at, and they'll swap out for somebody else, and then your task will get, your plumbing job will get done by a sequence of people who are just expert in that particular thing, just like in an automobile factory. 
And that degree of specialization could allow enormous productivity. Removing sp space as a constraint for specialization and expertise. Right. It's right. So as you may know, like bigger cities allow more specialization and have more productivity just because they're bigger, right? And small towns don't have as many different specialists. And so they often, you know, can't get the productivity gains that big city can. But remote work could allow small towns to have the specialization gains of a whole continent. And that's a pretty big deal. So that would be my competing hypothesis. If, if AI doesn't turn out to be as promising as it, many people hope, then that's still a thing that could happen over there. And it doesn't necessarily need to be either, either or, right? Of uh, course, AI would help make it easier to control these avatars. And of course, one of the things is at, if you have like broken the plumbing task into 20 different tasks, you could automate one or two of those 20 tasks and the customer would never know the difference, right? As long as there's a person doing the task and a robot can watch them, then they could learn from watching the human to do the task, to do it themselves. And that would be a way in which automation would be supported and encouraged by remote work. Now, one, one thing that you wrote and thought extensively about is uh, brain emulation. And I guess, uh, can, can you talk a little bit about what that is for people that maybe aren't aware? Sure. And do you think this is something that we're going to see in our lifetime? I don't know about in your lifetime, but let's explain that. So at the moment, the AI you're hearing about is humans sitting down and creating an architecture for a computer system and then running that architecture on data and then on cases where they plan out how that system's organized. And what they're trying to do is make a system that's as capable of the human brain. But when we look at the actual human brain, it's very complicated and has all these different parts working in different ways. We don't fully understand it, but we can see that it actually is a general artificial intelligence. That is, it is our human brains are capable of doing the wide range of things that we actually do. So another approach to artificial intelligence, i.e. machines that are as smart as humans, is simply to make a model of an individual human brain. That is, you take an actual brain and you scan and you see where all the cells are, of what type, connected to what, and then you have good enough computer models about how each cell takes input signals, changes internal states, and send output signals. And if you have good enough models for all the different kinds of cells in the brain, and you have a good enough scan of a brain to tell you where, which kind of cells are where, then you can make a computer model of the whole thing. And that computer model of the whole thing, if it's good enough, would have roughly the same input-output behavior. That is, you could hook it up with artificial eyes, ears, hands, and mouth, and then you could tell it to do something, and it might do something just like the original person would do in that same situation. So this is a path that should eventually be possible to lead to human-level artificial intelligence. And so then the question is, how fast will this happen? And, you know, compared to especially the other approaches to automating tasks. So... This brain emulation thing may take another century, but then again, making artificial, the other kinds of AIs as good as humans across a wide range of tasks, that may also take century. So we can't really tell which one would go faster. But the thing we can tell is that the brain emulation kinds of artificial intelligence are much more understandable, relatable, and perhaps, you know, ones we approve of more. So the brain emulation if we did a brain emulation of you, then um, when we turned it on, it would remember having been you just before we scanned you. And then you'll have to convince it that it's now a brain emulation. It will just assume it's still you. And it will have all the same feelings and inclinations and memories and skills. And so from its point of view, it is you. Now you can decide it isn't you, but it thinks it's you. It'll tell you it's you. It'll be very insistent on that. It'll be short. Um, eventually you'll have to convince that it is in fact a brain emulation, but we understand how these things work that in the sense that we can put these things together in a society and we can predict a lot about how that society goes because we know a lot about how humans go in our society today. So they will have some important differences that allow them to do some things we can't do, but to a first approximation, they're basically us. And so if you're worried about an alien future, that isn't like us and the things that we value disappearing, well, you should be less worried about that here because, hey, they are pretty close to you. Um, you know, on the one hand, you could think of a particular brain emulation as being you personally, uh, and you might hope yourself to come back as a brain emulation, but setting that aside, we could just think 
our descendants, if they were brain emulations, would just be a lot like us. And so whatever we were valuing in ourselves and afraid might be lost by other kinds of AI, well, this is less lost here. Now, my book, The Age of M-Work, Love and Life and Robots Will Rule the Earth, goes through in great detail what this world would be like, and it is substantially different than your world and life now. So I think this is the, one of the things you should just most expect. When we look in the past at all the huge changes that have happened coming up to here, that just sets the expectation that you've got to expect the future will also be pretty different in some big important ways. That you, you just can't expect the world you live in to stay pretty much like this world indefinitely. That's just not very reasonable given how much change has happened. So you've got to suck up and expect some substantial change. Now, you're, you're quite an academic polymath, uh, studying like a bunch of different things and having spent time in uh, artificial intelligence and economics and social sciences and physics and across the board. Uh, how has having this cross-disciplined approach or, or ability to, to study all these different areas, how has that impacted your uh, capability in going deep to individual areas? We haven't touched on aliens as well, and maybe we'll have to do another episode just on that altogether. We're running out uh, of time now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But how is that, uh, how is that more general purpose kind of large learning allowed you to go deep into these specific areas so well? Well, um, you know, polymaths have advantages and disadvantages. Um, one advantage is that if a topic just requires that you understand a great many things, then the polymath is up to that. So I would say my Age of M book really requires that you just understand a lot of different topics. My task there is to predict a whole future civilization based on one technology change, but I'm trying to predict all different aspects of life there. So you just need to know a lot of things to be able to do that task. And the other thing polymaths are good at is maybe finding neglected th topics between the other usual ones. That is, um, and one way to find an interesting topic is to combine previous ones. So whenever you come to a new topic, you, you have this whole toolkit of all the things you've ever seen that you're trying to say, which of all those things I've ever seen is most like this or most able to give me some insight into this. And polymaths just have a larger toolkit there. So if you're if you're trying to take on a fresh new topic, then, and you've just seen a lot of different previous topics, you're just going to be better at finding the matches between this new thing and all the other things you've ever seen. And so we're better in that sense at starting in on a new thing um, and on doing things that intrinsically require many things. Now, if you think about it, these are kind of just obvious implications of polymath. That is, that's just generally what they're going to be good for. Uh, they're going to be less good at sort of knowing more about a very particular thing, but maybe better at critiquing it from a wider range of views. The last, uh, the last one I want to ask you about, and I guess we'll press pause on, you have another wonderful book, uh, the, the elephant in the brain, which I think we can, we could spend a ton of time talking about as well as prediction markets and grabby aliens and, and all of that stuff. But the, the last one I wanted to, uh, before I let you go, uh, cryonics. And uh, I, I think you have you you're at least interested in the field, or are you actually? I am a customer. Going... This is my. So what? It, explain what this is for for people. So um, when medical science gives up on me, or I give up on it, if I'm allowed, then basically the plan is to freeze my head in liquid nitrogen after putting chemicals in it that will allow it not to crack when it freezes. So that means basically all the same chemicals are there, maybe slightly changed during the freezing process with the roughly the same relative orientations. And that means when there are these different types of brain cells in my brain with different, you know, chem different degrees of chemicals that represent their internal state, it should be possible in the future to scan that frozen brain and read out those cell types and those cell states and the connections between the cells and therefore possible to make a brain emulation. Uh, that's, of course, not possible now, but we're talking, you know, a while in the future. And while you are frozen in liquid nitrogen, basically nothing happens. Chemically, you're not, you know, there's just no changes. So once you're frozen, there are some changes that happen during the freezing process. But my judgment is that's relatively minor compared to how redundant the information is encoded in my brain in terms of these chemical densities and the relative orientation of these cell parts. And therefore, it would be relatively straightforward to make a brain emulation of me if only the organization I trust to keep me frozen actually does that. So I think that my major risk is that it fails to do that. 
unfortunately. But I give that at least a few percent chance of success. And so the alternative is worms eat me or this six succeeds. And so I think the cost benefit calculation is actually a pretty good deal because if this works, I could live for centuries afterwards, perhaps as a brain emulation. And um, the worst case is it fails just like what you're going to do instead. Uh, what What's the company that you're working with? How'd you go about finding uh, so I've just someone... used a company called Alcor, but I'm not strongly recommending it. Uh, in fact, another company called Grass Institute has been growing faster and because it has cheaper prices and maybe I'd be tempted to switch. But I weren't too lazy to bother to make a change. Uh, but uh, the fundamental problem with this area is that this topic has gotten free international publicity ever since the 1960s, because that's when this thing started. And in that entire time, they've only ever frozen like 300 people. And there's only like <laughs> 3,000 people as customers. So that's a really small market. So these firms have to charge a lot of money, and they're mostly sitting around waiting for the next patient. And it's just... Their, their fixed costs are really high. And so this stuff would just be much cheaper and much more reliable, and therefore gives me a much chance of lasting if a lot more people would buy into it. And so it seems to me a terrible shame. In essence, most people who die don't need to die in the sense that they could be a brain emulation later. And the reason they're dying is because they don't want to buy this product and because not enough of them are buying this product to push down the price and push up the reliability. So we're all stuck in a terrible situation where we wouldn't have to die. Now, you know, maybe this future world of a brain emulation world where you might come back to isn't exactly your cup of tea. Maybe you'd rather have come back into some other heaven, but sorry. <laughs> you know, this is at least not dying. And I don't think it would be such a terrible world. And in addition, of course, if it, if it continues that only a small number of people do this, the small number of people who actually do come back will be minor celebrities. They will be actual people from the old world. Um, and hey, I will have wrote the bick on them, so I will be an especially in-demand celebrity, so I'm less worried about whether anybody will want to talk to me or keep me around, uh, but that's the pitch. So the key thing you need to believe to believe this works, and I know many people are skeptical, is just the idea that you are your brain, and your brain is a signal processing system, and signal processing systems just generically have to isolate some degrees of freedom in which the signals are sent and processed from the other degrees of freedom of your system. So that's what your phone and your computer and your TV, et cetera, all do. Uh, they all have some degrees of freedom, i.e. certain wires in which signals pass along. And then they have to design it so that those signal degrees of freedom are insulated from other degrees of freedom so that random things happening don't mess up the signals and mess up the signal mappings. And so that's what your brain was designed to do each cell takes some signals in and sends the signals along certain pathways and then transforms the signals in certain ways and then sends the signals out. And the way it does that has to be such that it's isolating certain signal degrees of freedom from all the other ones in order to do this mapping. And in fact, when brain scientists have made models that seem to capture at least what some parts of the brain do, the models they use of each brain cell is actually really quite simple. So there's reason to believe that most of the each cell's complexity doesn't really matter. Even the signal processing degrees of freedom are relatively simple from the point of view what the rest of the brain needs. Um, but the, the key point is certainly that cells are enormously complicated, and if you had to, you know, model all of that complexity, then you'd be facing a very daunting task. But most likely, most of that complexity can just be thrown away. Because you don't, when you make a brain emulation, you don't need to model how the cell protects itself from viruses or, you know, makes energy or repairs its cell wall or all those other sorts of little things the cell needs to be doing. All you need to do is reproduce those signal pathways. Well, to the people that are watching this in 300 years, uh, because of your celebrity, hopefully I've glommed Maybe. on a little bit to your your fame, and I'm remembered as someone asking you about this. Well, right, uh, but if you would become a customer, then you could take advantage of that fame more, you know. So here's an here's an opportunity for you. 
this is a good solicitation for all we need to do is just coordination across uh, across humanity, right? Uh, something AI uh, is is often good for, I guess. But uh, no, I don't know that AI is good for coordination. Yeah. Well, thank you, Robin. Thank you for coming on. This was uh, amazing, and there's so much more we could have kept going on. But this has been a really fun conversation. Thanks for entertaining all these different questions. Thanks for talking. So that'll do it for the 59th episode of the Logan Bartlett Show. Thank you to Robin Hansen for coming on. Thank you to Rashad and Justin for their efforts with this episode. And thank you everyone for listening in. A really fun episode to discuss what the future looks like with the world of artificial intelligence. We look forward to seeing you back here next week on the 60th episode of the Logan Bartlett Show. Have a good weekend, everyone. Mm-hmm.